What if I told you that this bizarre-looking airplane is secretly the most important vehicle at NASA? Without it, men would never have walked on the moon, the International Space Station would have never been built, and even today, NASA still relies on this one aircraft for their biggest missions. What we are looking at is an unsung hero of the space race, a true problem solver. In the mid-1960s, NASA was quickly accelerating from their first human spaceflight to a full-blown moon landing. And in order to make such a giant leap forward, the Americans needed to start building much bigger rockets at a much faster pace than ever before. Enter the Saturn V. As tall as a skyscraper and as wide as a house, one of the largest flying machines ever made. Saturn V had to be big to accomplish its mission of landing men on the moon, but this also presented a sizable problem. The pinnacle of Cold War era aerospace engineering required a nationwide industrial effort to produce its components. The Saturn V's first stage booster was manufactured by Boeing in a suburb of New Orleans called Michou. It's just across the bay from Florida, where NASA had built their primary launch site on Cape Canaveral. So, transporting stage one of the moon rocket was a relatively easy trip by boat. Saturn V was a three-stage rocket, and to make matters much more complicated, those second and third stages were coming in all the way from California. Stage 2 was being built by North American Aviation in Seal Beach, while Stage 3 was manufactured by the Douglas Aircraft Company in Santa Monica. And the rocket's instrument unit, a giant ring that sat on top of the third stage and carried all of the Saturn V's navigation and control systems, well, that was built in landlocked Huntsville, Alabama. And at 10 meters or 33 feet in diameter, it was impossible to move the assembled rocket components by truck or train across the country. The only option that NASA had to move stage two and three from California all the way to Florida was to take them by boat down around Mexico through the Panama Canal and back up again. A 20 day journey that came with a significant price tag attached. At the time, the space race against the Soviet Union was in full swing, and NASA was in need of a transportation solution. This is a Boeing 377 Stratocruiser. It took to the skies in 1947 as one of the first large commercial airplanes. It could fly 100 passengers halfway around the world in a level of luxury that modern travelers could only dream of. By the mid-1960s, the propeller drive Stratocruiser was already being phased out and replaced by the more familiar Boeing 747 jet engine airliner, and that meant that there were now a bunch of very large airplanes kicking around, just waiting for a second life. You know what's fun? Finding out that some random company you've never heard of is selling your personal info like it's a clearance item at a garage sale. Your name, email, phone number, even your home address. Yep, it's all out there just waiting for marketers, scammers, and who knows who to scoop it up. And sure, you could spend hundreds of hours tracking down every shady data broker and manually begging them to delete your info. Or you could literally do anything else with your life. That is where Incogni comes in. They do all the annoying work for you contacting data brokers, getting your info removed, and making sure it stays gone. It's like having a personal assistant whose only job is to tell creepy companies to leave you alone. And because you're smart enough to watch the space race, Incogni is giving you an exclusive 60% discount on their annual plan. Just click the link in the description, use code SPACERACE, and start making it their problem, not yours. The man who seized this opportunity was named John Conroy, a very interesting guy. He studied engineering in Oklahoma before hopping on a train to Hollywood and working as an actor from 1937 to 1940. He then hopped on a boat to Hawaii where he learned to fly airplanes. He was working as a civilian at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1944, when the base was attacked by the Japanese. Conroy then immediately signed up for the U.S. Air Force. He was shipped out to the North Atlantic, where he piloted a B-17 bomber on 19 combat missions. He was shot down over Germany in November 1944, 
captured by the Nazis and held in a prisoner of war camp until the end of the war. Afterwards, Conroy was still flying for the US Army, but he was looking to branch out into new business. One night at dinner with a friend named Lee Mansdorf, they discussed the problems that NASA was having transporting their rocket boosters through the Panama Canal. Mansdorf brought up that he'd recently purchased several of the retired Boeing Stratocruiser airplanes, and he wasn't really sure what to do with them. And that is where the magic begins. Conroy has the idea that they can take one of the Stratocruisers and stretch out the body until it's big enough to hold a Saturn V rocket booster. Then, they make a deal with NASA to fly the boosters from California all the way to Cape Canaveral. This would mark the beginning of an important new company called Aero Space Lines. In order to convert the Stratocruiser from a passenger airline to a rocket hauler, they started by cutting the plane in half just behind the wings. They gutted the interior to make one big hollow tube, then they cut the middle section out from a second Stratocruiser and pasted it into the first plane to lengthen the body. And then they repurposed the airframe from a retired World War II bomber to build a new fuselage on top of the aircraft that increased the diameter to 6 meters. This was the result. They named it Guppy. I guess because it kind of looks like a weird fish. The plane was also sometimes referred to as Pregnant Guppy, probably due to the extended width. Anyway, Conroy and Aerospace Lines built this entire thing before they even talked to NASA. It was entirely self-financed, and even by the end of construction, Conroy had taken out loans on his house, his car, his furniture. He was in debt up to his eyeballs, so he really needed this thing to work. It was so bad that he had to borrow the gasoline to fly the plane himself from LA to meet NASA officials at the Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas. Clearly, he had bet everything on this deal. If NASA doesn't buy Guppy, then he won't even have enough cash to fly home. Conroy would end up hitchhiking all the way back to California and bankruptcy. When air traffic control saw this Frankenstein monster of an airplane take to the runway, they were so convinced it would crash that they preemptively called the police and fire department. But Guppy did not crash. It flew, and the aircraft performed flawlessly on its maiden voyage. The only negative effect of the modifications was a reduced airspeed thanks to excess drag from the giant fuselage. On arrival in Houston, Guppy was met with amazement from NASA. They had doubted that an airplane like this could even get off the ground, but after Conroy invited NASA's chief rocket designer Werner von Braun on board for a few test flights, he was convinced that this machine could help America win the space race. With Von Braun's blessing, a contract with NASA was signed, and Aerospace Lines became an overnight success. Von Braun would later say, the Guppy was the single most important piece of equipment to put a man on the moon in the decade of the 1960s. Now, how does something that looks so strange actually work? Well, in order to open up the cargo bay, you had to pull the entire airplane apart by unbolting the whole rear section and rolling it back. Then, the rocket stage was inserted and the two halves pushed back together. Since the first iteration of Guppy was basically just two big airplanes hacked up and pasted together, it still lacked many of the necessary features required by NASA. The cargo bay was just a big hollow tube that could not be pressurized, which is bad for sensitive rocket components that would be disturbed by constant changes in air pressure. And worst of all, Guppy wasn't quite big enough to hold the Saturn V's gigantic third stage. So Conroy and his team built this, the Super Guppy. It was still a Frankenstein monster of different airplanes, but this time, instead of starting with a passenger airline as their base, Conroy took a military cargo plane and cut it in half, then added 10 meters of length to the middle section, then built a much wider fuselage on top that extended the plane's width to 7.6 meters. The new cargo bay was fully pressurized and could open up like a book for easy loading and unloading. Super Guppy was quickly put to work transporting Saturn V components from California and Alabama to Cape Canaveral. Guppy was able to cut down a journey of 20 days by boat 
to less than 20 hours by plane. This was crucial in allowing NASA to rapidly build out their new fleet of gigantic moon rockets. Without the guppy, NASA would have ended up months or even years behind schedule. The Apollo missions might have never lifted off at all, and in the absence of America's dominance, the Soviet Union might have continued their own efforts to eventually land people on the moon. In November of 1967, the first ever Saturn V lifted off from Kennedy Space Center. By July 1969, the Saturn V would send the first men to the moon on Apollo 11. John Connery himself did not stick around to bask in the glory of the moon landing. In 1967, he cashed out of aerospace lines and was quickly onto his next venture, Conroy Aircraft, where he continued to design and build extreme new flying machines like the Sky Monster cargo plane and the Albatross amphibious flying boat. Unfortunately, Conroy's success wouldn't last. He became ill with colon cancer and died at the age of 58. But his legacy would live on in the Guppy airplane, which has continued to serve NASA and human spaceflight to this very day. NASA used the Super Guppy to build their first space station, Skylab, in the mid-70s. By the 1990s, Super Guppy was being used to transport American-made modules for the International Space Station. And as NASA looks to return to the moon in this decade and win a new space race in the 21st century, the Guppy series of aircraft are, yet again, playing a critical role in transporting components of the Orion spacecraft and the SLS rocket from coast to coast across the USA.